Um, Heather, sorry, you're muted. You should uh, unmute your microphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> You'd think after all this time, Zoom would be an easy thing. Well, there you go. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Talks, a program by the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. My name is Heather Darch, and I'm a program director for Quan. Our series this evening is called Sharing Our Heritage, and we've invited people from across Quebec's heritage and cultural communities to tell us their inspiring stories. And I find it so interesting to hear about the projects and publications, exhibitions and research being conducted in the small museums and archives and cultural community organizations right across the province. Quan is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve and protect and promote the history in all of Quebec, but in particular of Quebec's English speaking communities. And you're very welcome to become a member of Quan. And right now we have a special uh, discount offer going on uh, during the, the length of time of our program. It's a 30% discount. That's $20 for one year. And you can go to our website at qahn.org to go to the membership page and fill out your form and sign up and become a member of this really great and dynamic network of people. I would like to thank our funders who helped make this series possible, Canadian Heritage, the Zeller Family Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. All of our presentations are recorded, so if you've missed any or you would uh, like to go back and listen to them again, you can go to Quan's Facebook page. You can also go to our website and you can see the upcoming uh, shows to come and again find the recordings that you've missed. If you're joining us on Zoom tonight, please keep your cameras turned off during the presentation. And I encourage you though, to please turn your cameras back on when our guest speaker is finished so that we can create a nice little community. Uh, if you have questions and comments, you can use the uh, reactions button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand in the uh, uh, in the yellow uh, raise hand icon, or you can type in your comments and questions and we'll make sure that our guest speaker sees them. And if you're on Facebook Live tonight, uh, you can do the same, uh, put comments in the Facebook uh, Live section um, and we'll try to transfer them to you. Okay, well, our guest speaker tonight is Tyson Rosberg. And Tyson was born on Canada's West Coast but has been living in Quebec for 10 years, four of which have been out in the beautiful Eastern townships. Tyson obtained an undergraduate degree in British history with a specialization in the early 20th century at the University of Victoria before pursuing graduate studies in Canadian history at Concordia University in Montreal. His thesis utilized oral history interviews and focused on the lives of rural Canadians who lived through the Great Depression, particularly on the prairies and in Anglophone Quebec. After completing his master's degree, Tyson then went on to complete graduate studies in theology and now serves as an Anglican priest in many of the communities that his history research was focused in. He also holds a certificate in sustainable agriculture and food security from Bishop's University. Tyson is passionate about all things rural. He keeps chickens and lives with his mildly unruly Labrador retriever, Roxy. We welcome Tyson tonight with his talk, Tasting the Past, Food, Memory and Belonging in Missisquoi County. Hi Tyson and welcome to Heritage Talks. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, great welcome there. And I hope that the mildly unruly Labrador will not interrupt our, uh, our lecture, our discussion this evening. I'm going to just take a moment to share my screen because I have a little PowerPoint presentation for us to follow along. We'll start from the beginning of the slideshow. And just to provide a little roadmap on our discussion this evening, 
I wanted to begin by giving a very brief uh, history outline of the museum, the Missisquoi Museum, where I work, before talking about the history of Missisquoi County ever so briefly, uh, and then moving on to why food history or a defense of food history, before talking about some of the different aspects of food and farming from this county. And so to begin, a brief introduction to the Missisquoi Museum, although I'm sure many of you are familiar with us. But the Missisquoi Museum acknowledges with respect that we live and work on the traditional and unsurrendered territory of the Wobanakiak, the Abenaki First Peoples. And located just an hour from Montreal in the beautiful picturesque village of Stanbridge East along the Route de Vin, the Missisquoi Museum invites visitors to learn about the fascinating history of our region over the last 200 years. In 1830, Zebulon Cornell built a flour mill on the banks of the Pike River, and the mill built of red bricks was in operation for 130 years. In 1964, the Missisquoi Historical Society, which was established in 1899, and is one of the oldest historical societies in the whole province of Quebec, turned the three-story mill building into a museum. And 1964 is an important date for us this year, because if you do the math, 2024 marks our 60th anniversary as a museum, and the 125th anniversary of the historical society. So that's a big year for us here at the museum, and I just wanted to take a little moment to advertise this year's seasonal exhibit coming up this summer, 60 Objects for 60 Years, celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Missisquoi Museum. Of course, the Cornell Mill Building is only one of the three venues that the Missisquoi Museum operates. There is also Hodge's General Store, which was built in 1841 and provides the experience of an old-fashioned country store, largely untouched since the day of its closing. And of course, the famous 12-sided Wallbridge Barn in Mystic, built in 1882 by engineer and gentleman farmer Alexander Wallbridge, which houses the museum's extensive agricultural collection. And it is worth stating that while two of those three buildings are situated in Stanbridge East and the Wallbridge Barn is over in Mystic and St. Ignace de Stanbridge, we are not the Stanbridge East Museum. And we are really a county museum with collections and artifacts spanning from Noyan to Frelixburg, from St. Armand to Cowansville and everywhere in between. The museum is as its name implies, a museum for the whole of the Missisquoi area. And of course, it's a little hard for us to tell where Missisquoi region really ends and Brome begins, with our neighboring Lac Brome Museum having responsibility for the history of that area to the east of us. So that's a little introduction to the museum if you don't know about us. And Missisquoi region is located in the southwest part of the province of Quebec, in the area known as the Eastern Townships. And it's located in the extreme western portion of this area with its southern boundary touching the United States. And as I earlier mentioned, this region is the traditional territory of the Wobanakiak, the Abenaki First Peoples. And when you drive across the townships or through Missisquoi County, one is all too familiar with the scenes of rolling fields of corn and soy and down here, lots of vineyards and orchards also. And it is hard for us to imagine that before the coming of Europeans, the whole area was largely forested. And trees included varieties of maple and birch, beech, elm, ash, and oak, and coniferous trees like spruce, pine, hemlock, cedar, and tamarack. And this dense forest was inhabited by different animals, such as birds and bear, deer, beaver, raccoon, turkeys, pheasants, and many other kinds of animals, which provided both furs for trade and meat to eat. And indeed, the Missisquoi Museum's archives includes a 19th century recipe for beaver stew, 
that begins, first clean and skin the beaver, remove its head and tail and feet, cut the meat into small pieces and put it into an iron kettle with water, salt and spices, cover and boil until the meat is tender, with a note saying that a large beaver cooks for about four hours. As if everyone knows how to clean and skin a beaver, but the simplicity of those recipe instructions suggests that yes, at one point, this was common knowledge. Everyone knew how to skin and clean a beaver. And while not exactly haute cuisine today, the recipe certainly speaks to a time when those who shared food together were deeply bound to the landscape and to the world around them. There was no whipping down to the depener to buy a six pack of beaver meat. You had to go out there and get it yourself, and you had to know how to prepare it. And Missisqua can be considered the oldest part of the Eastern townships to be settled by Europeans. It was the only section where land was held under the French seigneurial system, with three seigneuries being granted under the French regime, Foucault, Noyen, and St. Armand. But initially, the ceding of Quebec to the British Empire in 1763 did relatively little to encourage Anglo immigration into the province. And few English speakers settled here, and those who did settled predominantly in the areas west of Montreal. Ultimately, I think it's safe to say that it was the loss of the 13 colonies in the American Revolution that acted as a catalyst for British settlement into Quebec. Of the approximately 40,000 United Empire loyalists who came to Canada, half of them settled here in Quebec. And the loyalists settled primarily in the eastern townships, quickly becoming the largest settler group in this region. And the Anglophone population of Quebec also increased dramatically, dramatically, drastically, as a result of massive immigration from Britain after the Napoleonic Wars who had changing agricultural methods, increasing industrialization in Europe, the rapid demobilization of the military after 1815, all of that contributed enormously to social and demographic dislocation in early 19th century Britain, and millions of people left altogether, with many coming to Canada. Between 1829 and 1859, Roughly 20,000 immigrants from Britain arrived at the ports of Quebec, and many of them settled largely in the eastern townships alongside loyalist farmers who had arrived here three decades earlier. And three townships in particular received the bulk of the newly arriving immigrants, those being Stambridge, Dunham, and St. Armand, so the area we're talking about this evening, Missisquoi. And the normal size for farms in the townships was 150 acres, with around 25% of that being arable land. So that's a very brief, brief introduction to Missisquoi County. Obviously, we could spend an entire evening talking just about that. Uh, but I just wanted to provide an over uh, sort of an overview, a context of the region we're talking about. And so a defense of food history. Why are we talking about food this evening? Food embodies community. It is quite literally the source of life. You don't have food, you don't live terribly long. And when we think about history, food may not be the first thing that comes to mind. And yet food has always been the keystone of human existence. Food is one of our closest gateways into the past. A way to experience another time while engaging all of our senses in a way that no book or memoir or diary can. After all, who does not have a memory of fresh baked bread or of grandma's homemade cookies? Who does not have some cherished family recipe lovingly handed down from generation to generation? Or a meal capable of whisking one back to childhood with only just a sniff or a taste. Food defines who we are and where we come from, what we deem to be important. 
So it's more than just details about what people ate or what they did not eat. Historical, historical accounts of food provide a unique insight into the daily life of those who preceded us. Insights into social etiquette and norms of the day, glimpses into a way of life. And we also get glimpses into the lives of women, into the domestic world, aspects which are often omitted or forgotten in more official accounts of history. So this is not a history of big battles or, or of important people, but about what those people ate. What did people do day to day and how did they do so? And here on the slide, we have a picture of a very fun object from the museum's collection. It's an 18th century lunchbox made of wood. And it belonged to a man named Ebenezer Phelps, who originally was born in Vermont in 1773, but who moved to Quebec sometime in the early 1800s and worked as a surveyor in Stanbridge East's early history. He died in 1843. And I don't think you can really get much closer to history than that. There's something that someone carried their lunch around with them every day. And from here, we're gonna talk about different aspects of food, beginning with bread. And in our modern age of low carb, keto and bread is bad diet, it is hard for us to really imagine just how important bread once was. Bread was an important mainstay of any pioneer home. And women might have baked bread several times a week to ensure adequate supply for their hungry, hungry families. But before grain can be turned into bread, the grain from the field must first be threshed. And in autumn and winter, the farmer would spend many, many hours in the barn threshing his crop. And this involved tirelessly beating the grain with a special tool called a flail to detach the ear from the stalks of wheat. So on the far left side of the slide there, you see a bunch of flails uh, from the museum's collection. And threshing by hand was absolutely time consuming and hard, hard work. I don't think we really realize how hard people worked just in order to, to eat. I mean, we're not even talking about going out. We're talking about in order to have that slice of toast in the morning, there's a lot of hard work involved in that. And once done, the grain was then winnowed to remove the chaff and any debris or dirt that was there. And working on a breezy day, the farmer would toss the grain into the air for the wind to then blow away the chaff while the heavier grains of wheat or rye or whatever the grain was would fall to the ground. And these time-consuming methods of working with grain remained the normal farming practices until the 1840s with the invention of the McCormick reaping machine. And prior to this, rendering the amount of grain produced on the average homestead would have required over 2,000 hours of labor. That's, that's a lot of time when we think about once the harvest is actually done, you've done the plowing and the planting and the harvesting, it then takes another 2,000 hours to process the grain. After all of that, the grain can then be ground into flour for eating. And early settlers would have laboriously ground their flour by hand using something called a plumping mill, akin to a large mortar and pestle often made from a carved out log. You make a bowl in a log. And as the plump was forced up and down, it crushed the grain inside. And the end product was a very, very coarse brown flour, which would then have to be sifted to remove large remaining chunks of grain. And obviously, only small batches could be done at one time, maybe as little as a few quarts of grain. And it goes without saying that this process would have been absolutely and completely exhausting. And the first industrialized flour mill operating in the area was in Burlington, Vermont, built in 1783. And grain from this region would have had to been transported either by boat across Lake Champlain 
or by horse along the winding back roads, a distance of about 65 kilometers each way. And George Mitchell built Brome Missisquoi's first flour mill in St. Armand in 1787. And in 1830, Zebulon Cornell opened the mill here in Stanbridge East, the building in which the Missisquoi Museum is today housed. And built on the banks of the Pike River, the Cornell mill used uh, wa a water wheel, used the power of water to power its massive grinding mechanism. And there we have a couple pictures of the mill, and on the bottom right we see the large millstone. And grain was poured through a small hole in the center of those rotating millstones. There was actually two, one on top of the other. And the grain was crushed between these two stones and emerged as flour. And the coarseness of the flour could be determined by the size of the gap between the stones. So if there was a large gap, you got a really coarse flour. Whereas if they were really tight together, the flour would be much, much finer. And the emergence of roller mills in the 20th century, which ground flour between turning uh, rollers, steel rollers, made stone mills like this obsolete. And the Cornell mill ceased functioning in 1964 to our benefit, because that's now where the museum is housed. And wheat flour is essential for making bread, but in times of scarcity or crop failure, a pioneer baker could rely on some rather interesting substitutes. And a recipe from the Immigrant's Guide, which was published in 1842, recommends that sawdust made from beech trees can make a, quote, nutritious substance, which may go under the name of bread, end quote. Yum, yum, sawdust. Other common substitutes included stretching wheat flour with ingredients like potatoes, turnips, corn, or even rice. And Johnny Cakes, a sort of uh, corn pancake, were an early pioneer invention made from cornmeal and required no wheat at all. And traditionally, sourdough, which has become quite popular again uh, through the pandemic, we all became sourdough bakers. Uh, but traditionally, sourdough used a fermentation of wild yeasts and bacteria to rise bread. And similarly, the foam byproduct from brewing beer, well, that foam could be used also, collected and put into bread to help it rise. But in the middle of the 19th century, other options for leavening bread became available, both baking soda and baking powder. And cow brand, the first commercially manufactured baking soda, appeared on the market in 1847. And when baking soda is combined with an acidic ingredient like sour milk or buttermilk, it releases a gas which causes the batter to rise, expand, but in earlier recipes, pearl ash or soleratus, both of those are made by pouring water through burnt wood ash to make a sort of lye substance, but those could be used to achieve similar results. Then baking powder was first commercially produced by Preston and Merrill of Boston in 1850. And Practical Housekeeping, a book which was published in 1860, stated that bread prepared using baking powder, quote, saves time, simplifies the whole process, saves labor, and reduces the chances of failure to an absolute minimum. And technical innovations in the late 19th century allowed for the large-scale manufacturing of commercial yeast which quickly became the normal method for making bread rise. And during World War II, uh, Fleischmann's developed a granulated active dry yeast just as we know it today. So if you whip down to the IGA, to the grocery store, that's what you can buy in the little packet is active dry yeast. And that first appeared in the 1940s. And so once you've got your, your grain ground, you've got your flour, you've made the bread, 
So bread could be baked in a conventional wood oven. And the first iron stoves uh, have been cast in parts of Quebec beginning in the 1740s. However, there was a problem of transporting these weighty appliances. You can imagine that a cast iron stove is very, very heavy. And it was also very costly at the time. And this meant that open hearth cooking was the norm for many, many years. That people cooked either outside over a fire, or you would have a fireplace in your home in which you could hang kettles or put pots and pans. So in the early years, bread would have been baked in an iron kettle with a lid placed over hot coals, and you could put more coals on top of the lid. And it goes without saying that it would have required immense skill and knowledge on the part of the baker to maintain a uniform heat so that the bread would cook properly. While other food like scones or johnny cakes, pancakes, could be baked on a griddle an iron sheet that could be hung directly over a fire. But in the latter 19th century, foundries capable of producing stoves locally began operating in the region, reducing the costs both for transportation and production because things could be made more locally. One such enterprise was the Bedford Stove Company, established by Horatio Horskin in 1860 in uh, Bedford. And Allen and Taylor of Waterloo also produced stoves, as did the Walbridge Iron Works, founded in Mystic in 1868. And on the slide right now, we have a picture of a cast iron Prince Albert model double box stove made by the Bedford Stove Company in 1871. And the stove is now in our museum collection, but was originally owned by Andrew and Janet Getty of Cowansville. The new houses built around this time dispensed with the old practice of having an open hearth as the center point of the kitchen, and now you had an iron range or a stove. And many homes even had a summer kitchen built off of the house, uh, away from the home, so that when you cooked in the summertime, those who were living in the house could be spared the heat of a wood stove during the hot, humid months of the summer. Uh, and that's a picture, actually, of the rectory, the house where I am coming to you live this evening, uh, the church house in Stanbridge East. And as you can see on the left side, uh, there's a wooden summer kitchen which is attached to the stone uh, rectory. And the wood part is the summer kitchen where all the summer cooking would be done so that those who lived in the house wouldn't be stoked out by the hot, hot temperatures in July and August. And from here, we're going to talk a little bit about dairy. And butter and cheese making were an important activity on the early Missisquoi farm. And both were a key method of food preservation for long-term storage. Because unlike raw milk, which will go bad if you leave it out, these milk products could be salted and thus made more resilient uh, and less relied on cold storage. You didn't need a fridge or anything, an ice box. And English styles of cheese making were introduced by the loyalist settlers here first, while later Dutch and German immigrants they brought with them their own styles of cheeses. And on the left side of the slide, we have uh, an interesting picture of some new artifacts that we acquired in the collection uh, last year. And that's a picture of some cheese presses that used to be used to make cheese on the Garrick farm, the Garrick farm in Dunham. And Joseph and Laura Garrick bought their 380, excuse me, their 380 acre farm in 1857, and it is said that Laura kept a herb garden just outside of the cheese house, uh, which she used to flavor the different cheeses. And the cheese was sold locally and as far away as Montreal. And wooden cheese presses like that were used to extract the moisture, the whey, from the cheese in order to give it a drier, firmer texture. So as the thing was pressed down, the water would be pushed out and a drier cheese lasts longer, something like a cheddar. 
And the first cheese factory in Quebec, the second in all of Canada at the time, opened in Dunham in 1864. And only a few short years later, the Dunham Creamery was utilizing the milk of 900 cows and producing over 100 tons of cheese per year. That's a lot of cheese. And spurred by the expansion of Quebec's railway network in the latter 19th century and the subsequent ease of transportation which it brought, Missisquoi became a major dairy producing hub. And by 1900, there were 31 creameries operating in the area, over 2,000 recorded dairy farms, and some 20,000 dairy cows in the region. But the growth of the dairy industry had some interesting implications for the division of labor within farming families. Because traditionally, it was women who had been in charge of both animal husbandry, the keeping of cows, and the production of butter and dairy for the family, or for trade within the local community. But the transition away from the farm into industrial production of dairy, into larger herds, specialized buildings, new technology, that moved dairy away from the home production into the market economy. And the result was that women became distanced from economic power in dairying. So that's something interesting that you don't really think about when we think about the history of dairy. And butter making was another method of food preservation for long-term storage. And butter molds, such as the one on the bottom right of the slide, were usually carved wooden molds uh, and allowed farmers to give their unique butter uh, a trademark that would help consumers identify it at market. And fresh butter was pressed into a carved wooden box and then finished with that decorative stamp. And this was a way of identifying uh, whose farm, where the butter came from. You knew the butter producer was based, uh, you knew who the butter was, or sorry, you knew where the butter came from based on the design that was imprinted upon it. Uh, a sort of 19th century uh, label marketing system. And from here, we're going to talk about apples for a little bit. And apples were a mainstay crop brought by early pioneers to their farms in Missisquoi. And in particular, the gentle slopes around Fredericksburg proved favorable to apple cultivation. And in 1798, Captain J.B. Scofield, a loyalist from New Hampshire, planted the first recorded orchard in the region. Likewise, Thomas Arms from Vermont planted a large orchard near Fredericksburg in 1800, which was heralded as one of the best in Canada at the time. And these early orchards paved the way for what would become a very lucrative part of the farming economy in Missisquoi County. Apple seeds or pips, rootstock and grafts were eventually introduced from the United States, England, France, and various other far-flung growing localities. And before long, almost every Missisquoi farm featured an orchard, either for home consumption or for sale. And by 1927, the Pomological Society of Quebec singled this region around Fredericksburg as the best place for growing apples, needed to supply the growing market of, of Montreal. And two years later, Quebec's first commercial planting of apples, so a commercial orchard, uh, was opened on the land of Ferdinand Paquette in St. Armand. And the very first atmospheric controlled storage facility in the whole of Canada was opened in 1964 in Fredericksburg. And by the 1960s, Missisquoi Farms were yielding upward of a million bushels of apples per year. That's, that's a lot. And here we have what I think is one of my favorite uh, artifacts in the collection. It's a picture of the whole sapple apple peeler from the museum's collection. And it's made of wood and it dates from around 1790, uh, late 18th century. 
handmade and it was used by the whole Sapple family who farmed in St. Armand. Uh, I think that's just fun. It's the apple peeler owned by the whole Sapple family. The whole Sapple apple peeler, say that 10 times fast. In a popular English dessert, apple pie also holds a special place in the life of the Missisquoi Historical Society. And this year, the much-loved Apple Pie Festival, which happens every year in September, it's a major fundraiser for us. It will be celebrating its 40th anniversary. And Canada's first sugar refinery was opened by John Redpath in Montreal in 1854. But previously, all refined sugar had to be imported from the United States or from England at great, great cost, making it largely unaffordable to most people, most farmers. In all but the wealthiest of households, white sugar would have been reserved for very fine baking and for very special occasions, maybe for Christmas, for weddings, for wedding cakes, things like that. Raw sugar cane from the West Indies was cheaper, but was excessively moist, dark colored, and had a very strong taste like molasses. And so the most economic and accessible sugar alternative for Missisquoi farmers was, of course, that made from maple trees, maple syrup, or maple sugar. Those of us who are in the region today, uh, many of us commented that it almost felt like sugaring outside, but maybe not quite yet, but spring is coming. From here, I want to talk briefly about food storage and pickling and fermenting. And here we have uh, on the top left a picture of some of, the some of the museum's crockery and stoneware collection. Really beautiful stuff if you like uh, collecting that. And some of it's quite old. It's very early 19th century, early 1800s. Uh, some of it possibly even loyalist. And stoneware really was the Tupperware of its day. It was used to store everything from water, soda, beer, to meat, to grain, jelly, and pickled vegetables. And stoneware was produced in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. And these ranged from common jars and jugs to more specialized items like pitchers or water coolers and pots. And I believe the one that you see wrapped in wicker on the far left, thats uh, it's got a little spigot so you could store uh, beer or water or uh, liquids like that. And before modern refrigeration, pickling foods ensured their availability over winter. Because, you know, that's another thing that we've forgotten in our modern diet, that we can whip down to the grocery store any time of year and get fresh produce, fresh meat. Uh, but that wasn't the case uh, hundreds of years ago. You had to preserve food if you wanted access to it in the winter. And few foods escaped the pickling jar. Everything from apples, pumpkins, walnuts, mushrooms, eggs, and even meat gained an extended shelf life through pickling. The original pickling vessels were simple jars or crocks made of stoneware, like the ones in the images, and remained in use well into the 19th century. And the canning of food in airtight glass jars was first experimented with in France in 1809 and proved a useful tactic for supplying troops with unspoiled food during the Napoleonic Wars. And the mason canning jar, such as the one I'm drinking water out right now, the mason canning jar was patented in 1858. And fermentation was a traditional means by which food could increase its shelf life using lactic, lactic acid bacteria, which leaves a distinctive sour flavor. So sauerkraut made from fermented cabbage is a well-known example. Uh, also kimchi, an Asian version. And we have a picture there on the uh, right side of the screen, as well as a close-up on the bottom of a large cabbage slicer for making sauerkraut made of metal and wood dating from around 1860. Uh, and that's certainly a whopper.
One of the earliest references to vegetables in Missisquoi's history dates to 1784, when Philip Luke recorded selling 40 heads of cabbage to one Adam Young for a mere two pounds. And other recorded vegetables traded at Luke's store in the later days of the 18th century included peas, potatoes, corn, beans, turnips, pumpkins, but in the ledger it records pumpkins, P-U-N-K-I-N-S, pumpkins, and squash, but recorded as S-Q-U-S-H, scush. So pumpkins and scush. Early gardens would also have featured vegetables like cucumbers and carrots and beets. Parsnips, too, were grown, and they were often left unpicked and stayed in the ground during the winter so that they could be picked in early spring, providing fresh veg when little else was growing or available. And in 1870, the memoirs of Anglican Bishop Ashley Oxenden mentions a gift of cauliflower, tomatoes, French beans, and melons being given to him by local farmers when he spent a summer in Dunham. And lastly, I wanted to talk about tea and coffee. And we have a lovely picture here. I'm, I'm really fond of this picture. It's a, a lovely uh, two ladies outside uh, enjoying what looks like uh, coffee. Uh, looks like a coffee pot there. And common to most breakfast tables today, tea and coffee were once very scarce and very expensive commodities imported from British colonies abroad. And both would have been status symbols, and the serving vessels often ornately reflected this. Things like fine china. And when coffee was available in Missisqua County, the beans were often sold green and would have been or would have required to be roasted at home. And on the right side of the slide, we have a picture of a handheld coffee roaster. Uh, that was recently given to us or acquired from the former Missisqua or uh, the former Phillipsburg Historical Society. And it was used to roast small batches of coffee at a time over a fire, enough to make maybe a pot or so. So you'd put your beans in there, put it over the fire, and I guess sort of just turn it around to tumble the beans. And when coffee was unavailable, some interesting alternatives were available. Things like roasted chicory, which is a plant, dandelion root, or even dirt mixed with a few coffee grounds could make uh, something like coffee, I guess, dirt coffee. That's a way of extending the coffee, although I'm not sure it would be terribly tasty. And on the left-hand side, we have a picture of a metal plated tea caddy from about 1820, another from the another artifact from our collection. And this caddy belonged to Eleanor Holmes and she was born in 1786 in Ireland and arrived in Quebec sometime in 1820, 1821. And her tea caddy would have been displayed with pride in her home as tea was a luxury item imported from overseas colonies from India. Early settlers to the region would have also quenched their thirst with drinks like barley water, made from simmering barley grains in water, herbal teas, broth, milk, and apple cider. Ginger beer or spruce beer, made from the needles of the spruce tree, might have also been an occasional treat. And I wanted to mention something of a conclusion here about a bygone era, because it will be of no surprise to many of you that the Anglophone presence in this region remained strong until the 1970s and the 1980s, when the demographics of the whole of Quebec began to rapidly change. Between 1976 and 1981, 95,000 Anglophones left the province altogether due largely to new political fears engendered by the rising nationalist movement under René Levesque. At the same time, changing economic realities contributed to migration out 
of the rural regions of the province, out of the townships, into urban centers, or out of the province altogether. So not only do we see Anglophones leaving the province, but we also see rural communities, rural farming communities begin to get smaller because people are leaving family farms and going to work in the city, getting city jobs. And I think this is an important thing to remember because in a sense, what we are talking about this evening is more than just food or it's more than just farming. It's looking back at a bygone time, a bygone community, a bygone way of life. And when we talk about memories of food, we speak to a time when meals were prepared at home using homegrown ingredients, things grown from the garden, from the farm, caught in the woods, with a deep and intimate connection to the land and to the world around them. And when those who shared in these meals were deeply connected by communal ties. And this is a connection that I think today largely exists only for many people as a nostalgic memory. In a sense, memories of food take on extra special meaning in this case, because we're talking about more than just food, more than just food history. It's also about memory. It's also about belonging. It's also about community and really also about nostalgia. So that concludes the formal part of my presentation for this evening. Uh, I believe that was around 40 minutes and I'm uh, open to discussions, comments. Uh, hopefully other people might have some stories or some details they'd also like to bring up. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and we can all uh, have a conversation. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Tyson. Um, if you'd like to turn your cameras back on, and I know some people have been putting some uh, uh, questions into the chat box. And uh, while you're sort of getting ready, uh, I'll just uh, say thank you, Tyson. That was, uh, it's food for thought. A lot of the things that you said. <laughs> um, and I, it brought me back to potluck suppers. You know, I grew up in, in the church community and there was always potluck suppers. And uh, my role as a kid was to set tables or to put chairs up. And of course, my mom was uh was cooking for that with all the, the women societies within the church. And as a minister, you probably uh, see sort of a, a profound lack of those now in out in not just Mississauga, but uh, in the world uh, of, the, uh, of the Eastern townships. And, and I wonder what, what that says to you about uh, uh, with the loss of, of that sort of thing, the closing of churches and the, mm. the, the, the breaking a, a part of the community that, that was always around those events. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I certainly think that the old idiom that if you, uh, give them food, they will come. That certainly rings true very strong that uh, you want to, uh, well, you know, a church community, but you want a, church, a, a community in general, put on a supper and people will come. Uh, I didn't talk about it in my presentation, but I know uh, in my master's thesis, I had one interview which came uh, from someone in Cowansville. So it would have come through the the archives at the museum. But she remarked on church suppers in the 1930s and how you knew who everyone was and everyone brought something grown from the garden and or a pig from the farm. And there's a deep connection to the land, which we don't have this, I mean, today. I mean, in one sense, we certainly don't have a connection to the land because you can whip down to the IGA and pick up uh, whatever you want. You don't need to worry about uh, where it comes from, per se, how it's grown, how it got to your table. And I think also, you know, as I mentioned towards the end of my presentation, the, you know, sure, Anglophones leave the province, that's one thing, but also just the, the decline of rural communities in general. I mean, we live in an area where, you know, 20 years ago, everyone knew everyone. And now many of us don't know our neighbors because they've changed in the last five years. You know, even, even in the short time that I've lived in the townships, I remark, you know, oh, I don't know anyone in this little village anymore because there's been such a rapid turnover. So there's definitely a, a loss of community around that. So so maybe we do need to have a few more potlucks, just, you know, pitch a tent and invite people over for a meal. 
Yeah, I think so. It's been a long time since I've been to a potluck. So, and I mean, I know the museum has the wonderful apple pie festival. So that's uh, uh, reflects that sort of community mm. effort, you know, mm. and uh, homemade pies. Most of them are, I think. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Now, there's a few questions. Uh, Judy Land says, where would the dairy farmers send their products to be processed? Or was it only for their own use? Ah, okay. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, the number of uh, creameries operated in the region. There was one uh, in Dunham. That was the first one which opened. There was also one in Stanbridge East. Uh, I mentioned a number of them. I'm not sure how many uh, I said off the top of my head, but a couple hundred uh, by the turn of the century were operating in the area. And from there, I mean, dairy was exported into Montreal. I mean, that's not really exported, but sent away into Montreal uh, for Montreal, for city markets, but also, uh, you know, to prepare for this uh, this presentation, I was looking through a short history of Quebec by John Dickinson and Brian Young. Uh, not necessarily that short, but very concise and easy read. And it talked about also how uh, beginning around 1900, uh, Quebec was actually exporting dairy uh, into the United States chiefly, but also sending things back to Europe. And the bulk of that actually came from dairy farms down here in Missisquoi County. So you know, what started out as a, you know, a cow in Dunham could have ended up on someone's plate in, uh, in Philadelphia. And I think too, with the refrigerated box cars that came in in the 1860s, that, that was the allowed farmers to transport their milk to Montreal for sure in the larger market. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. Now, Joyce Denny says, my husband tapped the roadside maple trees yesterday. Aha, uh -huh. there are 150 pails being used. Most of them were full this morning. The boiling down has begun. Wow, we're an hour north of Toronto, Ontario. My goodness, see, it, we, ha we had that sense today yeah. when we first came on that it was it would just felt like we could go to a maple cabin today. So, yes. And then uh, I may just say a little plug that, you know, as a, a kid from the West Coast, from Vancouver Island, one of my absolute, absolute joys uh, is going up to uh, one of the farms in Frelicksburg and helping sugar. You know, I get such a joy out of carrying the buckets and dumping the buckets into the big bucket and then going into the boiler and uh, a Weldon Hadlock, a local guy, he runs the fire and, you know, we're there for an afternoon a couple times a week and there is just such joy being in the woods. I mean... You know, I almost tell my parents, how come we didn't have this? I mean, how how come you you kept me from this secret? But obviously we don't sugar in British Columbia. So wrong trees, wrong climate. Well, I grew up in Ontario and did not have real maple syrup till I moved here. And it was mind blowing when I had my my first taste of real maple syrup. And you think, oh, I'm just in Ontario, but uh, it was considered too expensive by my parents, I guess. And uh, so we always just had the fake stuff and uh, which I loved until I realized, oh, there's no comparison. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, Michelle Thibodeau says, I have fond memories of picking vegetables with my grandfather in his garden and bringing them in and preparing them with my grandmother for our meal during summer visits. Those carrots, cucumbers and tomatoes were the best. Excellent. There's sort of nothing better than a than a garden. And I think there's a sort of a return to gardening. Uh, I, I know a lot of people that have started up a small veggie patch just for that sense of uh being connected to to land and and getting mm. back to, and I wondered if you saw that as as people came into the museum, did they were they talking about their own experiences of growing vegetables? And... Yes, uh, I will say that, and I will also say that uh, during twenty twenty, when the world became very scary and uncertain, uh, I dug up a twenty by thirty patch in the front lawn and said, you know, at least. At least I will have a carrot. I will not. I will never go hungry again. Uh, <laughs> so I think I definitely think that uh, you know maybe it was there before COVID, but there is this returning interest in gardening and sourdough baking. I mean that was the huge explosion during COVID. Uh, I mean people are more and more interested in this stuff. Does the museum have a a big collection of recipes uh, that that uh, that have come in over the years or? 
there's a ton of cookbooks uh, in our archives, uh, some of them very interesting. Um, what I think one of the challenges for me is that there are so many recipes, but you often don't necessarily know uh, the context behind. Like this is a great recipe book, but how related to Missisqua is it? Or is this someone who came to Missisqua and brought a cookbook? Or is this a recipe from elsewhere? Um, and I will say that uh, we re republished, rebound uh, a cookbook, which the museum produced, I think, oh gosh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but we reproduced it for sale now. And it includes some historic recipes as well as you know, different people's favorite uh, recipes from the community. Well, I do say I, I, I love the beaver recipe, <laughs> ugh, but it's it's quite <laughs> it's quite something. Yes. Is that from the collection? Is that That, from that is book? from the collection. And uh, I mean, yes, it's a bit ick factor, but I, I love it in the sense that, you know, you can't get much more back to the land than, you know, than beaver stew. And as I said in the presentation, I mean, it just says, you know, clean and skin the beaver and boil it. I mean, you know, as if everyone knows how to do that, which which tells me that at one time that was pretty common knowledge. I mean, people knew how to do that. So, you know, most of us think, Ick, but that was the way people lived. Yeah, yeah. Beaver stew and dirt coffee. Mm. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, Mary Goodfellow says, do you know anything about how settlers would protect themselves from eating something that might cause a stomach ache or may even be poisonous? Uh, I would hazard a guess that, again, there was, you know, common knowledge. I suspect, you know, to be honest, people were probably a lot more sick more of the time. And that was just kind of normal. You ate bad meat, you got sick. OK, kind of normal in a way that you and I are horrified, horrified at the thought of food poisoning. I think that that was just so much more common in previous generations uh, so there's that. I also think that things like the Immigrant's Guide, which I talked about, published, I think, in the 1840s, uh, there were probably a few chapters on things you should not eat or, you know, things that you could eat. Um, because there's also things, you know, I didn't talk about foraging. I mean, you know, fiddleheading, you know, guilty pleasure of mine come April, May. I mean, you know, you need to know how to prepare those things. And that was taught to me by someone. And you know, I think people would have helped each other out. Uh, but absolutely, I think that, you know, people were just a lot sicker than you or I are regarding food. And that was a bit normal. Um, I see that Simon Jacobs has posted a photo. And I wonder, Simon, would you could you come on and tell us a little bit about that? Is it in your backyard? <laughs> No, 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 it's not my back. Well, I, figuratively, not literally, it's in it's in the Côte de Beaupré. We find a lot of these type of bread ovens that are there, which date back to even early uh, or late 1700s. I'm just actually, you suddenly got me thinking about it, and I just really found a book called The Bread Ovens of Quebec, which was published. And in fact, you can get a... Um, you can get uh, right off the internet uh, from the museum. Um, which one is it? Anyway, Museum uh, Canadian Museum of History. You can actually download this this book. Um, so, because you were mentioning that people were basically making their bread in sort of cast iron skillets with a lid on the top beforehand, but I think these these definitely predate the uh, the cast iron stoves that you talked about. But you didn't mention it in the talk, that's all. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, French Canadians, habitant farmers, had you know the this cob or earthenware, not really brick, I don't think, but you can see those uh, uh, all over certain parts of Quebec. Uh, and a very, very good friend of mine who I did my master's thesis with, he actually built one in his backyard following the instructions or the specifications in that exact book. I mean, he was stomping on the clay and the, the hay and, uh, you know, did the whole thing as an experiment of, you know, is this thing going to work? And a year later, he's still baking bread in it. So yeah, absolutely. There were sort of early earthenware uh, uh, ovens in which you'd light a fire and then you'd get the coals out and then you put your bread in, seal the door, trap the heat and uh, 
Yeah, I, I heard this story that um, apparently the, uh, the women, when they were preparing the fire, they would open the door, stick the back of their hand next to the door, and if they could say a Hail Mary without burning their hand, the oven was ready. I love that story. Yes, yes. That's I mean, funny. I... There are lots of, uh, I think, King Arthur flour. If you look at some of the early recipes, say that if you can hold your hand in for 20 seconds, it's around whatever, 350. If you can only stick it in for 10 seconds, it's around 400. If you stick it in and go, ow, uh, it's too hot for baking. Uh, you know, things we don't think about because, of course, you just set the oven to 350 and the thermostat, the thermometer tells you, okay, it's time to put your food in. You know, you don't get that on a wood stove. You don't get that on a wood oven. You don't mm -hmm. certainly don't get that on an open fire in your backyard. So uh, there's a lot of those. Are, oh, sorry, Simon. I was going to say a lot of those early recipes say put in a hot oven, you know, and if you're trying to cook from an early recipe, it's sort of just guessing maybe 450 uh, Fahrenheit. It's hard to know. Yeah. yeah. What's a hot oven? The, the other thing is I, I just came back from India and um just looking, it's like uh, the way people were living 200 years ago is the way people are living um, off the land and uh, building clay ovens and uh, and so on. The, the even buying chai, it's in a little clay pot that you you drink and then throw it away because uh, it's only one use. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's something that we've lost in the industrialized world. I mean, I've spent. A certain amount of time in East Africa, and it's it's the same thing. You know, people are cooking over open fires, and you want chicken for dinner, you have to go out and grab the thing as it's running around the farm. So, you know, but it's something that we in the industrialized West have certainly lost touch with. Mm -hmm. And anyway, thank you very much. Really interesting talk. Thank thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Marilyn says, I love this information. I'm from Pontiac County in Quebec, and my daughter and son-in-law have a dairy farm here. Where right. is your museum located? Ah, the museum is located in the beautiful, picturesque village of Stambridge East, uh, which uh, I guess the closest bigger city would be Cowansville, and we're about, what, 15, 20 minutes uh, down the 202 from there. So close to the American border, about an hour south of Montreal. And we are open uh, in May until Thanksgiving weekend in October. So only seasonal, open in the summer. I love kitchen objects. And uh, I wondered if any of our uh, viewers tonight have stories about an object they have in their kitchen that reminds them of cooking with their moms or their grandmothers. I have a, a nut chopper uh, that I, I, it's just glass with a, a metal lid and you pound it up and down to chop nuts. You've probably seen them in, in uh, on, uh, garage sales and that sort of thing. But it's really special to me because it's the one thing my mom would let me do during for baking Christmas cookies, you know, keep her busy chopping nuts while, you know, she made all, all her wonderful cookies. Um, and so it's very precious to me. And I wondered if, if anybody else had an object in their kitchen that they could tell us a small story about it. Maybe you do yourself, Tyson. Uh, I do. I could say that uh, um, my family and my dad's side, traditionally Norwegian, uh, and Christmas is not Christmas without uh, krumkaka. It's a like a like a waffle cone type thing, but it's a uh, flavored with cardamom, and it's it's like a waffle iron almost. You put the batter on, you press it, you flip it over. I have a cast iron one, uh, largely unchanged in design, probably since the eighteen fifties. You know, you put it on your stove, then you flip it over. And then while it's still hot, you take it out and you roll it on a wood cone in order to get that cone shape. I mean, Christmas is not Christmas without some of those to dip into your tea or your coffee. Uh, super traditional. And uh, I always had to have one. <laughs> the museum must be filled with uh, kitchen objects like most uh, small county museums are. It is full of kitchen objects. Uh, tins and things. I mean, those pictures of the baking powder and baking soda, those those are in the collection. We have all of these interesting old tins, jars, crocs. Uh, you know, I mean, I would love to just sort of bring it all home with me, but that's <laughs> frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is indeed. 
Well, I don't think there are any other questions. There's certainly uh, comments of, to thank you for your, uh, oh, someone, Michelle. Hello, Michelle. I have an old metal flower sifter from my mom. Oh, I think I know the kind you mean. Yeah. It's in a cupboard and I, use a, I used a teacup from a great aunt the other day and it felt great to feel connected with her and family stories. And that's, that's what it is, isn't it? It's that connection to an object and it brings back those wonderful memories of cooking and eating and socializing together as family and friends. That's great. I have a, you know, uh, well, grandmother recently passed away and I have one of her, her China topspin saucers that she got at her wedding back in the 1940s. And it's just like, you know, you can't get more connected than, than that. I mean, something she would have drank out of you now hold in your hands and, and Simon says he has a Sabbath plate from his Ooh. family. Oh, there it is. So sort of there. Yeah, there, there it is. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's cool. It's disappearing into your background, Simon, a bit. Oops, sorry, you're on mute. Maybe Allison can unmute you. Don't worry, you're not the first one to talk being muted. <laughs> I did it earlier. <laughs> Yeah, I think I should just take off the video thingamajob, video setting, blow my background shoes, none. There we go. And what is a Sabbath plate? I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. This would have been, actually it says, uh, this would have been used at the Sabbath during a, a Friday night Sabbath. Uh, you'd have had food off it or presenting food on it. This was made in Carlsbad which is, I think, uh, in, in the Jewish Pale of Settlement. I'm just trying to find the year. Let me just do a little Google search. And it would serve uh, um, fish or breads or anything, um, any kind of food? Well, it wouldn't be, but, um, I think it was more just, a, I'm not even sure, actually. To be honest, I don't know. I think this is more... Um, uh, ceremonial just for showing up, but it does mention uh, um, I, I, I need to look at it and see for sure. Uh, let me just see what year it is because it says 1928. So this oh, is wow, 1928. This, this particular very one. nice. And, and I have you, uh, you still use it, or it's hung on your no, wall. No, this one, this one is, uh, this is one is kept behind glass, as it were. But we also have some, uh, uh, like the kiddush cup, which was presented to my grandparents when they emigrated from um, Poland, and we still use that. That's for saying the blessing over the wine, and wow. so these are things which are still being used uh, used today. Yeah, my husband's family is uh, Swiss and German, and they have a big sauerkraut crock, you know, that's very special to the family. So all the different kinds of cooking traditions come into different artifacts as well. So, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nadine says, thank you for a great presentation. Looking forward to getting back to Stanbridge East and visiting the museum again. And yes, I encourage you, if you haven't been to the Missisquoi Museum, it's just this lovely little museum on the, the Riviera Bochette. And it's on the wine route and it's uh, it's along all the orchards and it's beautiful scenery and it's uh, near the American border as well. It's not it's just like an hour and a bit outside of Montreal. And uh, in the summer, they it's, they're open full time and uh, it's, they would love you to support them. They're just one of those small museums that functions on a shoestring budget and they have such a marvelous collection. So if you have some time this summer, I encourage you to go to uh, Stambridge's, the Missisqua Museum, find some nice lunch in the area too. It's uh, it's quite a happening little village and it's been marked as one of the, the prettiest rural villages in Quebec uh, several times, hasn't it? So... But I think we'll we'll bring our, our uh, presentation to a close. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Tyson, for a marvelous presentation. This has been a lot of fun looking at history, uh, you know, not, rather than military or like we often will do, looking at it through food. And it's just it's this marvelous world that opens up to us. So thank you so much. It was really quite wonderful to hear uh, uh, about food preparation. And, and I'm thinking now of cherished recipes I have in my own collection. And I'm sure you all are, too. Um, 
thank you all of you who joined us today. And I hope you can join us next time for our next presentation is called Stone by Stone. And it's by the Canadian Irish Migration Preservation Network and the Irish Cemetery Restoration Preservation Project. And it's with uh, Kelly O'Rourke, Laurie McCune and Fergus Keyes on Tuesday, February 13th at seven o'clock p.m. right here on Zoom or on Facebook Live. And you can still find the speaker lineup or the ones you've missed on Quan's website, qahn.org or on our Facebook page. And you don't need your own Facebook page. We're, ours is a public site. So you can just go there and click register uh, to, for Zoom. And don't forget to become a member too. Uh, you get your uh, copy of Quebec Heritage News and it's featuring the Walbridge Barn, which is part of the Missisquoi Museum's uh, site, uh, this, this, this particular issue. So that's very, uh, very nice. And um, uh, so, and become a member by going to our website. So thank you, Alison Kirkwood, who's running all our tech today and keeping us muted and unmuted when we're supposed to be. Um, until next time, thanks again, Tyson, very much. And have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Absolute pleasure.